<laughs> okay, cool. So after that, my clicker work uh, on. Woo, okay, awesome. Woo, thank you for your patience, everybody. Okay, so first, I need to know uh, where my friends are at in the room. Uh, by show of hands, raise your hand if you have binged watched a Netflix original show ever. Okay, that's like pretty much everyone, and I assume the rest of you are lying. You're like, well, I watched like, I w had a work day in between the first and second season, so I didn't technically binge watch the show. Um, so I'm just gonna call that everybody. Um, what was, uh, let's see, shout out, anyone can, shout out the name of a show that you binge watched recently. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I have been unabashedly addicted to Queer Eye. Uh, my wife and I have watched, it's the best show. It is the best show. I have become an actual evangelist for this show. I think that everyone should watch it. It is the most beautiful thing that I have seen on television. And if you think that I'm lying, this is a conversation, my wife actually just sent this to me yesterday. Um, not knowing that I was going to talk about uh, the best show on television. Uh, this is a conversation that she had with a Zappos representative uh, who, had just, <laughs> who had just finished Dark. And they were like, oh, I'm looking for a new show. Do you have any recommendations while we have this thing process? She's like, well, my husband and I are binge watching Queer Eye, but um, that is so far removed from Dark. And Justin, put it so beautifully, said, I watched that first episode and was like, man, I didn't even know I had feelings. What the heck? It was super emotional. And he's not lying. Every, I, every episode, every episode is just a spectrum. I know going into it, it's a spectrum of like, either just like a little misting around the eyes to like full on sobbing, snot, everything. My wife thinks I'm possessed. Usually we like, we like sit on the couch, like, you know, enjoying a show. And she's like far away. She's like, what did you do with my cold hearted husband? Because this, something's wrong. So I started to ask myself, like, what is it about this show? Like, obviously, if it's like whacking me every time, there's something about this show that I, f I feel deeply. And I want to know what that is. And I want to be able to, to figure it out so that I can live more fully, more happily, live a little bit more like the people at the end of the show than the beginning of the show. And I've decided that it comes down to this idea of transformation. Now, transformation different from conversion. And so we'll talk about that a little bit. But um, the idea is transformation, that you have something, it exists in one form, and that over time it becomes something, a different form, but it's still the same being. And this is, in terms of this talk, is going to be the potential for change, the potential to change. Now, the opposite of a potential to change or ability for transformation is stagnation. This is something that holds the illusion of something that is alive, but isn't actually alive. It isn't changing, it isn't transforming, it is not developing. And I think that this is where a lot of us feel stuck. It feels stuck when you're in something that is stagnating. Um, we're not going to talk about religion a lot, but this is my personal experience. I grew up in a very strictly religious uh, household and church. So I grew up in a Baptist church, and everything is either a sin or right at the front door of a sin. There's like very little that is like actually part of life that you can enjoy. And this really drove me away from the church because it felt like I was riding this really tight line of, um, of like how I could express myself, how I could interact with the world and the relationships that I could have. And um, it wasn't until, you know, later, I mean, like, much later, maybe, like, three years ago, that I actually, like, went through, read the book, and realized, like, oh, this is about, like, relationships, relationship up, relationship out, relationship with the world, like, how we conduct ourselves, find our identity, and, like, be kind to people. And so I started to think about how that impacts us and our code. And I think that a lot of times, if I had to wager you feel stuck in your code bases, whether it be the language that you didn't pick, whether it be some rules that you don't agree with, some formatting that bothers you every single time someone comments on your pull request to change it to the standard style. There are a lot of things that keep us feeling repressed and not feeling like we're actually doing good work serving the customers and serving our app. So uh, this talk is in three parts, um, a time that I felt stuck in our code base, um, some signs of deathly code, 
um, and some esoteric stuff about farming at the end. <laughs> uh, so now the first thing we need to do in order to talk about code quality and code cleanliness and like what matters and what doesn't is we need to talk about ideal code. How do I define ideal code? Now, I borrowed my definition from Sandy Metz, uh, who is a world-class Ruby developer. Um, we learned this morning uh, from Lori that most Ruby devs do not pick their language, but I think that she did. Um, she loves it, um, and she is fantastic. If I could tell you one thing, I would say go find all of her talks, listen to them, because they will make you a more pragmatic, empathetic, uh, reasonable developer. And so her, um, her uh, talk on design. She says in her book, um, Object Oriented Design in Ruby, the purpose of design is to allow you to design later. And its primary goal is to reduce the cost of change. And the reason for that is, is that usually when we have the responsibility of making something for our customers, something they've asked for, or something our stakeholders need, they, we only have a partial lens into what that thing will ultimately be. But we have to build it anyway. And so if we optimize our design for making hard decisions later, then that makes it easier to change in the meantime as some of those constraints become more apparent over the weeks, months, and years. Um, and she broke down a lot of tenets for me that I felt at, that I held as immutable truths of good quality code. So the first one is dry, and uh, the other speakers were kind of poking fun at me because I have some visual representations here. Now, who has heard that dry code is good? It's like better, right? Yeah, you don't want to repeat yourself. Repeating yourself is bad. So she, um, we were going through some code. She was like, kind of like mentoring our team. And, uh, and she was like giving us challenges. And we would like give back examples. And then we had one that we were particularly proud of because it was like super dry. It was awesome. And she said, that code looks so dry that it chafes. And what she meant by that was that we've all heard that like, dry code is good, but there's a context in which it can be bad. And I want to show you that context right now with some Play-Doh. So right here I have some Play-Doh that uh, is fresh out of the jar. And this Play-Doh is moldable, right? It is not dry. It is moist, maybe? <laughs> I don't know if I can come up with an acronym for that. But it's moldable. We, can, we, we have this Play-Doh. We can make it whatever we want. Now, on the other side, I have this Play-Doh that I left out. You can see, I don't know if you can see from there, but it's a little, it's a little crusty. And this is, this is effectively its final form. It's not going to change much from here. So if I squish it, it doesn't change much. If I really press on it, it kind of crumbles. It starts to break at the edges. Now, what do I do with all this Play-Doh? So what I learned is that there is a context for everything. And that a lot of times that line is things that we know and things that we don't know. At least that's how I see it, and that's how we're gonna kind of talk, progress through this talk with those boundaries. So things that we know, those things definitely need to be stable. Again, like you're not going to build a building out of Play-Doh. We want hard materials to reinforce the things that we know to be true and change very little. But on the other side, we have a bunch of stuff that we don't know, a bunch of things that we don't know about our customers, things we don't know about the space, things that we don't know about our team. Like, our team is growing like 200% like every year. So every day we have a new team, effectively. And the problems that we get into is when we take rules from one side, either side, and try to adopt them in the other. So for example, like stable, long-lasting code should be dry. It makes sense that we don't want, we don't, if we want to make a change, we want that to propagate to the other parts of our code base that are strong and stable. So that's good. However, if we try to put dry on the pliable side, things that we don't know, well, then we end up with this. We end up always, like, constantly breaking things. This irritation of, like, having to Google, like, do I use oil or water to rehydrate this Play-Doh? I still don't know the best way. I just buy new Play-Doh because it's cheap. And that's what we do a lot. We end up saying, like, this thing is screwed. We're just going to have to rewrite it. Now, on the other side, we have, um, like, readability is extremely important for code that churns a lot, things that we don't, um, when we don't know clearly what that code is going to be, like what the final form of that code is. However, 
we have code that is intentionally unreadable. We have code that has to be performant. That is its highest goal. And the fact that only a handful of engineers are able to decipher it is actually a feature. It makes it, that thing needs to be stable and performant, and those are the highest goals of that code. And so when we try to apply readability to that, well, then our performance suffers. So we need to be careful about which, like taking laws from one side and trying to apply them to the other. So uh, this is the part where I tell you a story about a time I feel s felt stuck and um, my shit literally flipped during this moment. So uh, we had a, a brand new, uh, a, a brand new project that we were working on. It was kind of like a new login screen for all of our apps. I work on a suite of applications. It goes from uh, we have was it eight applications. We needed a new login chooser thingy, you know, so you log in, and they would ask you, like, hey, we're, we're going to log you into this app, but do you want to log into another app instead? And I was feeling very excited, because I'm, I'm a designer, and um, we'd been using React for about, like, three and a half years at this point, and I thought, man, we've, we've learned a lot. I bet that when I go into that code base and, like, start styling stuff, like, the code is just going to be awesome. Like, I'm going to love working in that app. It's going, to be, it's going to be incredible. Like, we've learned so much. There's been so much crappy code that I've worked in. Like, this is just going to be a delight. It was not. So I get in there. First thing I see is this. So like, hey, you need to style the uh, login dropdown chooser. I'm like, OK, cool, no problem. So I open up this file. Um, I see, OK, so we've got an unordered list uh, with a list item and then like a dropdown menu in it. OK, whatever. Uh, I'll open up the first uh, thing. I'll look at that app button. Uh, I open that up. And I see, OK, so it's like defined in this file. Uh, it's used somewhere else. I guess I'll figure that out later. And um, this is the place I'm using it. OK, cool. I open it up. I'm like, damn, that's a lot of code for like an app button. But whatever, let's go, th let's go through this. So we have like, you know, a bunch of like flow annotations at the top. Like that was something new that everyone was like super excited about when they started. OK, cool, whatever. Uh, no big thing. Uh, this is the component definition. Um, and then this is really the like four or five lines of code that actually like do anything. And so I start looking at this thing, and I'm like, okay, so it's an anchor, it's got some classes applied, uh, it has an on click, and then it like has this like app name as a prop. I start thinking, I'm like, I'm pretty sure that all of this like 50 lines of code does is like make this button that is written as an anchor inaccessible and do anything. So I'm like, that sucks. So uh, OK, whatever. Uh, let's just uh, let's move on. I open up app dropdown to see what else is going on. I see that it's kind of the same story. Uh, it's defined, and it's only used in one other place. Great. Uh, again, flow type annotations, a bunch of stuff at the beginning. We have, and then this is the uh, component definition, and then this is the bulk of the code. And I start to wonder something else. I'm like, OK, so as a front uh, developer, I know like a little bit about like HTML accessibility and some like you know standard stuff, and I, I look at this and I see this div and this anchor and this unordered list. And I remember like, oh man, wasn't there like, wasn't this inside of like a list item? And so I have this list, this unordered list, the list item with app dropdown, which spits out a div uh, with like other stuff inside of it. And I'm like really starting to get pissed at this point because like I'm going to have to re put together all of this stuff. I'm going to have to oil my Play-Doh just to be able to style this stupid thing. And my screen looks like this at this point. Like, what the hell are you doing to me? I was so happy about jumping into your code. And so I just I changed it to this. And I was feeling pretty good about myself. I got to like delete two component files. Like, this is awesome. This is like a you know, better starting point for me. But now I have two test failures. I'm like, damn it! Are you kidding me? I was like, I'm a designer. I'm just trying to like style this code, like get it, you know, get it to be using the right elements, and like now I have test failures. Do I fix those? Do I throw it back to you and make you fix them? So components are awesome, um, but they also suck because it merges everything together, and all of these like team line, all these lines that we've had historically um, are a little bit blurred. And so the practices that you think are best and whatever make it hard for me to do my job. 
Now, this, this goes both ways. I know absolutely that I have made some very strong enemies with the way that I prefer to write CSS. So I want to tell you five, like a handful of signs of deathly code, way that you, ways that you can think about um, code through this example. So the first thing that I think is like a sign of code that is going to chafe you is speculation. Now, this is the most unholy ESLint creation that I think exists today. And this is the root cause of why some of this code was, um, was hard to deal with. Now, if you, um, every time I go into a file, like I don't even, like because I work across the teams, I don't even look, I just disable this rule. Like I, I have a key, key command for it. Like I don't care if you have it or not, it's getting disabled. Um, so what it does is it enforces that you only have one component per file. Now the problem with that is, is that you have to name things. And we're notoriously bad at naming things. We're terrible at naming things. So what happens is he's making the, they're making this login chooser. And then they're like, oh, OK, well, we have this thing. And it looks like a button. And it has the app name inside of it. So we're going to call that app button. Now the problem with this is that anytime you like kind of hoist something up at the top and say, this is the app button, life finds a way. <laughs> Other people are going to look at that code, and they're going to try to be responsible and be like, has anyone ever solved this problem before? Is there an app button that I can use and like be responsible with co this code base, not duplicate things, because I've heard that dry is awesome and important all the time, immutably. So how can I, can I, can I use this, reuse this app button? Now, that's good. It's awesome, except for this app button sucks. We've determined this. And so every time it gets used, that suck propagates throughout the app. And the suck gets harder and harder and harder to remove the more places that it is. So, um, so, so uh, talking about that change that I made, we have the login chooser, we have the app drop down, we have an app button, all is like first class files. Well, that sucks. Um, because, like, you know, so we have, you know, the, the app button file is defined as its own, the uh, app dropdown file is defined as its own, and then we have this login chooser that kind of imports both of them and composes them together, even though all of this is just wrapped up to support this one function or this one feature. So I ask that as you're working through your code, like, one of the signs is to make fewer assumptions. Don't assume that, like, you have made the perfect app drop down button, unless you have other cases where it's like, oh, this also serves these things. So like, this is pretty good bet that we're going to like, be serving our app well in the future. And stop naming things. Just stop. If you, can, if you can not name something, do that every time. So in this case right here, I have, um, I have these three files. I, the, the change that I made was I just kind of pulled them in. I deleted the uh, app button. I just made that a, a component in the same file. Uh, I deleted the app dropdown, made that a component in the same file. And then now the, now the file looks like this. I export the thing that we actually designed. And like everything has this kind of coherence. Like this app button is not general purpose. It only serves the thing that we've designed it to serve. Now, later on, if we decide, you know what? Like, you made a pretty classy drop-down button. Like, we want to export it and see if this could be the one app drop-down button, or the app button for app. Sorry, I keep mixing these words. This is why naming things sucks, because like, it's just so hard to like, talk about anything. Um, so, um, so you can like, just export that in isolation, see if it works. You can do the app button, see if that works. Um, and then ever, if ever down the road, you're like, you know what? We're really feeling confident that this thing is the one. I think we have a winner. We got it right the first time. You can actually s explore like, having an app drop-down file and then just like, kind of importing it from the, the, the place where it was designed with a specific purpose and then like, export it as app drop-down until you're like, you know what? This is it. We're going to stamp it. So completionism is another thing that bothers me. So I want you to watch this. Who's seen this gift before? Okay, not everyone. Oh, beautiful. Okay, I'm going to let you watch it a few times. I think this is actually a like an ad for slim Samsung TVs, um, but I see it as like the perfect illustration of why unit tests are a bad idea. <laughs> so this guy just kind of waddles around with a big flat screen TV. 
and then leaves the strobe of the TV. It's beautiful. So now each of these components were kind of like, kind of again, like kind of crystallized into this form of like, oh, I think we got it right. And we have all of these interface tests to make sure that they stay that same way because damn it if we didn't get it right the first time without knowing any of the possible situations where it might be used later. So what happened was when I deleted these files, well, now I have these tests and I have to delete these tests or just figure out how to merge them into the login chooser. Now that's a real pain in the ass because like these tests are all like they are all set up to like import that specific thing, test its unique interface instead of testing it from the outside in. So I much prefer um, in these situations where I have uncertainty, I don't know what the final form of this component or feature is going to be, to just test the feature, test at a high level, whether that be something where you actually spin up a browser for, or something you just do like an integration test on that high level component, like test the feature and like let the implementation change. So if I'm in, in their style, I shouldn't be breaking tests by just like applying a couple classes. Things should be able to change, should be able to move around, and like the test that a user can click that button, click the app, and get logged in should persist. So um, this is one of my favorite quotes about uh, tweets about testing is um, write tests, not too many, and mostly integration. My rule for this is to test as close to the customer as possible. Uh, there is a, there's a sense of like kind of completionism when you see a file without a test, you're like, oh, you know what, I'm just gonna go in and like write some interface tests for that, like use TypeScript. So nits are another place where we start to see like code start to crumble. And I don't have a lot, of, um, a lot of advice for this. I have one thing, it's gonna be the one thing that I actually tell you you have to do. Um, formatting makes everyone myopic. You could write the best pull request with the most, for the most thought through feature using the most well-designed code of all time. And if you have a semicolon out of place or like you accidentally used a tab instead of like a couple spaces, like that's the feedback that you're gonna get. So what we do is um, in not all of our apps now, but we had started transitioning our apps to Prettier. And uh, who's heard of Prettier? Okay, cool. So about half of you. Prettier is this amazing thing where basically you decide on a, decide on a handful of uh, things, uh, rules that you want your like, uh, code to be styled by, but really it's pretty opinionated out of the box. It's going to give you a pretty standard format, do some like, things, things for you out of the box. Um, but it takes a lot of these nitpicky arguments about code out. And it's actually changed the way that a lot of us think about code. We think less about code being like this thing that we, is like our art and like I'm applying my style, like to the, my personal style to this code and how lucky are you to have someone that thinks about style as much as I do. And we think about it more like, uh, like how the computer sees it, which is like the computer doesn't give half a shit about how you style your code as long as it works. Um, and this has allowed us to write thinking more about the code and knowing that it's going to, um, knowing that like in the pull request it's going to look right. You can integrate this in your uh, editor or also as like a pre-commit hook. Uh, and the last thing I'm gonna share with you today um, is this idea of noble obstacles. These totally get in the way of our code. Um, so uh, I read a book recently called Finish, Give Yourself the Gift of Done by John Acuff. And uh, he says, noble obstacle is a virtuous sounding reason for not working toward a finish. And this is something that I feel all the time. And I imagine that you feel it too, is that if I commit code that I know has some type of shortcoming uh, that that reflects on me, that it reflects poorly on my ability to kind of look into the future and say, oh, you know what, um, all of these things are possible, so I'm going to like make it performant out of the box. I need to do like, I don't know, X, X Y, and Z. And so I tend to compensate for that by just being way too rigid and like doing way more things than is necessary and I'm hurting myself in the future. I'm like making decisions about the future that might make it harder to change. 
So what I've started doing is uh, I just add a comment into the code when I do something that I feel is like a little bit dirty. So like this one is I just put debt, date today, I did a bad thing, PM said ship it with a link to the Trello card. Now what this allows me to do is I actually have a couple tests in place where I will generate warnings based on there being too many debt, uh, debt comments in a file. And so this helps me identify like, you know, we've been like really like kicking the can on this thing for a really long time. It's possible that it's, it's time that we actually give this thing first class treatment. Um, I do the same thing with perf. It's like, I don't know yet uh, how this thing's gonna get used, how it's gonna get hammered, um, but this is like something that we should probably think about. I know that it may be a problem, but it's not a problem that we have enough data yet to solve. So we're gonna kick the can down the road for a little bit, but I know about it. This helps me out dramatically thinking about, or like when I'm making a pull request and thinking like, oh man, they're just gonna judge how, um, like if I've been able to predict the future well, instead of just solving the problem at hand, the, the thing that our customers actually want. Uh, I'm going to tell you a really quick story. We have, um, so we had uh, Sandy Metz uh, out to train our company on some, uh, some, some programming um, techniques and tactics, and she was telling us about this, um, a, a way to evaluate code, quality of code, and whether it needs to change as churn versus complexity. How often does the, f the, the file change versus how complex is it? How, um, how many uh, kind of decision trees that it has in it? So, um, so that was like a, a really interesting thing, but she found this one class that she was just totally enamored by, and she said to us, she said, this is uh, the dirtiest Ruby class I think I've ever seen in my entire life. It's absolutely terrible. And we're like, thanks. <laughs> it's good to have you out. Uh, what time does your flight leave? And <laughs> <laughs> but she was like delighted by it. She's like, but it's amazing because this code never has to change. Like this is very hard working code. It's terrible, but it just kind of like continues to work. She's like, it would not make business sense for you to change this code at all. The effort would way outweigh the reward. Um, and then I think two years later, uh, a friend of mine met her up at the conference and she didn't remember us, but we just said, oh yeah, you know, like, we had that core chart RB file, and she was like, yes, I tell all my classes about how terrible that class was. She's like, <laughs> she said, she's like, please tell me you haven't changed it. And that just spoke volumes to me, that, that her, um, her pragmatism allowed her to see beauty in this terribly dirty code. So why is this hard for us? This is very emotionally hard for me. I know that it's hard for the rest of you to let go of some of these things and like trust other people. So why is this hard? I think it ties into who we are. Um, I think that we have a fractured identity about what the work that we do um, and what we're supposed to be able to know and uh, accomplish. Um, and I think it has to do with what we believe code is. Now, the thing that I think is a little bit broken is that we aren't builders. Um, and this is kind of hard to swallow because we have all of our identities built up into these roles of building. We have developers, we have architects, we use frameworks um, that have scaffolding sometimes. All of our work uses these building analogies. Now, I think that that's a great way to kind of describe the process of writing code, the fact that everyone has a different role and we come together to, like, to, to, to raise something up or create something. Um, however, I don't think it adequately describes the way that we feel every day about working in a code base. And one of the things that's strange is that a lot of apps will outlive our um, our dedication to it. So, you know, the apps that I work on now existed five years before I came to, um, came to Planning Center. Uh, I have put five years in now, but they'll probably last until after I go into retirement, hopefully. So we edit, and our work doesn't last. I think that what we do, we are farmers. Bum, ba dum, bum, 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 bum. I know you're thinking it. <laughs> and I think we're farmers because we work on living things. Code is much more like a living thing than a structure that is like built and planned and doesn't change. We're beholden to outside whims, the whims of our customers, our stakeholders, our managers. 
And buildings don't grow in place and then slough off their dead selves like an app does. I think we cultivate and we work together with our code to be able to create something that's going to serve us today, tomorrow, and hopefully five years from now. We work with our code to make a product, and we work with our customers to make the right product. This partnership really blew my mind. The idea that I would invest daily into this code, and if I wanted it to treat me well, I had to invest good things into it, and I had to like think about me, tomorrow, our customers, and optimize for change despite uncertainty, without speculation. This is a very tight line that we're walking sometimes. So remember, the goal is to serve, to share, to adapt, and make that cheddar, duh. <laughs> and change ain't always pretty. So I'm gonna leave you with, oh, 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 no. I'm gonna leave you with my favorite quote. This is what we, uh, we reference this Bible verse, ironically, uh, every time we're about to, to ship something super dirty in our app. Um, so the Bible verse goes like this, uh, where there are no oxen, the stable is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. Now, Proverbs are a little bit weird, I know, um, and they're a little bit polite. Uh, so I'm gonna break this down for you. Clean code is dead code. There's shit where money is made. Get it. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>